We're studying in the book of Romans. Powerful book, profound book. And uh, it looks like we still have about the same number. <laughs> haven't, we haven't lost anybody, I don't think. <laughs> then again, maybe we have, and I just never did count. This is a section that we're about to enter into in chapter 6. As all sections of the book of Romans is, um, is important theologically, and it's important practically, and I think we'll see that as we work ourselves uh, through these verses. Now remember, the book of Romans has uh, made clear to us that all men are sinners, and as sinners all men are subject to the wrath of God, and, um, and that our God, because of his love and his grace, has made a way for sinners to escape. It's a way made possible because he sent his son to die for us on the cross and take our place and provide a payment that we could not pay. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That uh, payment that he makes uh, for us is only appropriated uh, by faith, by faith alone, in Christ alone. No amount of religious activity, no amount of human goodness, no amount of human merit of any kind is acceptable to God. The only thing that is acceptable to him is a broken and contrite spirit opening helpless and hopeless hands to receive the magnificent gift of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. And then we saw... Um, Paul uh, speak to the question of, so how did we get in that place? How, how, how did we get in this fix? <laughs> and we uh, looked at the reality that the sin that has infected all of mankind started with one man, that's Adam. And because of his sin and rebellion, his nature was changed. And when his nature was changed, he passed that on to all of us. So all of us sin, and all of us are guilty because we were in Adam. We were literally inside of him. All of the human race has come out of Adam, and we share his uh, guilt as sin spread to all men. And when sin spread, the consequence of sin also spread, and that is death. So we talked about the fact that all men are sinners and all men are subject to the consequence of sin, which is death. That is both physical death, um, spiritual death, and eternal death. Now the important thing that Paul wants us to understand is that because of this truth, because of this principle that the act of one man can have such a detrimental impact on so many, uh, we, we can rejoice in the fact that the act of the second Adam, the act of Jesus Christ, can make a way for all those that come by faith to escape the penalty of death and to be um, brought into eternal life. And in fact, Paul went to great lengths to talk, and we talked about last time, to, uh, to indicate to us, to prove to us that the act of Christ, his one act, far surpasses the act of Adam in his sin and rebellion because the act of Christ doesn't just merely cancel out the effect of Adam's sin and return us to a state of innocence where he and Eve were in the garden. Rather, it uh, justifies us, it makes us righteous, it fits us for heaven, and it brings in what Paul calls the reign of life over and against the reign of death. That means we now are alive, and we now live to him, knowing him, in something called eternal life forever. It only comes to those who come by faith. It's not a universal, or not an, an argument for universalism. This act that he does is adequate for all, but it is effective only to those who put their faith and trust in Christ. And by his act, God has made a way to bring a people 
to himself, to redeem a people who will be in heaven to praise and glorify and worship his son and him for eternity. That is the ultimate purpose, and that is what Christ has made possible by his one act of dying on the cross in payment for sin. Now, as we came down through uh, chapter 5, we got to uh, um, uh, Paul's uh, verse, the, verse 20, where Paul says, Moreover, uh, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the law came, made clear the offense of man, no longer a general concept of evil, but a sp- specific set of uh, regulations or a specific set of uh, ways that we understand the holiness of God and it codified and it made um, sinners specifically guilty for certain specific acts. But, but, But no amount of sin, that is no amount of violation of God's law, no amount of violation of God's holiness is uh, outside of the grace of God or the the reality that God will forgive any sinner and any amount of sin no matter how egregious that sin is. Grace far surpasses it. It is potentially available for all of mankind and all of the sins of mankind past, present, and a future. But he says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now, the problem that Paul has <clears throat> as we uh, move uh, through his uh, very profound arguments presenting the gospel and salvation by grace uh, through faith is the response of religionists um, many uh, Jewish religionists, but this is a this is an accusation that would be raised by self-righteous pe- people all. And it's this: <clears throat> if God saves by His grace, and if grace is made manifest when sin abounds, um, why can't we just sin away? so that God can show more grace. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't God glorified when he shows grace? And we can provide a way for him to get more glory. All we have to do is sin more. Uh, Behind that is this idea that, uh, that says, God can save Hitler? God could save um, Charles Manson? Manson? Are you kidding me? You're telling me that all of my church going, all of my goodness, all of who I am doesn't count for anything and God in an instant, in a moment would save the most heinous of sinners? Are you kidding? That's impossible. See, grace is uh, offensive to men and women, particularly to self-righteous people who think they're good by their lives or by their actions. So Paul has a problem, and he has to come against it. And it's a twofold problem. One is the attack of the legalist who said, God can't possibly let that kind of person into heaven. He has, to, he has to give some credence to being good. And then, and then there's the other side of it. Um, that, that's the side that says, okay, um, I get it. I'm saved by grace. Whoopee. Where's the nearest bar? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go out and have a, a lot of fun because I'm saved by grace. So all my sins are covered. Where there's 
grace, where there's sin, grace is far more abundant. I can live any way I want to, and God will save me anyway. It is a, well, well, you can, well, we kind of smile at that. Both of these things are true today, just as they were back then. Because I've run into a number of people that say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. Um, I, I, it's okay if I leave my wife, because this other woman is very attractive to me, and I, and I know God will forgive me. I know God will forgive me. Uh, there's, there's no reason why I, I can't just keep doing what I'm doing because I'm a Christian. I'm saved by grace. God will, God will forgive me. I'm going to heaven. Turn with me to Jude, uh, Jude 4. Because this is a problem right from the beginning in the early church. In Jude chapter 4, <clears throat> for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for their condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and di deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It, that's exactly the problem. That's what the false teachers are teaching. In fact, that's, that's at the root of Gnostic philosophy, which played havoc in the early church. The idea that man is dualistic, he is spirit, and he is flesh, and, and the only good part of man is the spirit, the flesh is no good and sinful, and what we need to do is just forget about the flesh, because all you gotta do is make sure that you're right spiritually, then you can do anything you want, and in fact, you can't do anything about the flesh anyway, so don't worry about it. I read an article uh, someplace, I don't know if it's true or not, but somebody said that Rasputin, you've heard of Rasputin? Very, very evil man, sinful man, an advisor to the Romanovs. And that was his um, theology. I I'm going to give God the chance to really show how gracious he is because I am just going to sin to the greatest level I can. Well, Paul isn't going to uh, bow to legalists. He is not going to change the reality that salvation comes only by grace through faith, not any good works. He is not going to bow there. And he is not going to bow to the lawless, to the licentious, to the ones who misuse the concept of grace to justify their sinfulness. What he is going to say is, we are saved by grace, and we are truly transformed and changed. It is a supernatural, miraculous thing that happens. And if you are truly saved, if you have received the grace of God, you will live a particular way and not the way you used to. And that's where we are in chapter 6. Now as we go through this, if this chapter doesn't spur some questions in your mind, if you don't uh, uh, think for a moment that I'm not sure I quite understand this or could this possibly be what he means, then I think you're not reading this uh, closely enough. I've always said that the Bible assaults you. If you're not being assaulted by the scripture and the way you think, if you're really comfortable in everything and all things that you're doing, you're probably not reading the Bible enough, or if you are reading it, you may not be reading it correctly. Chapter 6 is magnificent, but it is profound, so let's start into it. In verse 1, Paul says, What shall we say then? Now again, in response to this, to this uh, wrong understanding of verse 25 where it says but where sin abounded grace abounded much more some people are using that to justify their sinfulness and Paul starts off by saying what shall we say then rhetorically shall we continue in sin that grace may abound are you kidding me I mean this is an expression of horror 
You can't possibly mean that. You can't possibly get that from what I said. You can't possibly believe that God saves you by grace so that you can go on sinning. Certainly not. He says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Well, what does that mean? Look, we talked about death, the various kinds of death, as being uh, a, a, at its essence, at an ultimate uh, separation. A spiritual death is what happens to us because of Adam. We, we all are born spiritually dead. We are separated from God. We cannot understand him. We cannot know him. All human beings are born spiritually dead. We die physically and we enter into the grave. We are separated from God spiritually because of Adam. We are separated from all our loved ones and all the things that are important in life itself by physical death. And eternal death is just a continuation of spiritual death forever with the added impact of the pain and agony of hell. It's eternal separation. So when, when Paul says, we, we died, he says, we died to sin, what, what he's saying is we have been separated from it. We, we, we have been separated from sin. D death and life cannot coexist. They are incompatible. And that's what Paul says. If you have come to Jesus Christ, you are different than you used to be. It's irrational to say that you can live the way you always lived before, perpetually live that way, and actually have been born again, brought alive, made spiritually alive. In other words, what he's saying is a justification cannot exist apart from sanctification. Salvation, as we've talked so many times, has this three-part aspect to it. Justification, that is, we are justified before God. We are freed from the penalty of sin. We enter into this new life, and we begin to be sanctified. We are changed into the very image of Christ, and that process ends in glory. Sanctification is possible because the body of sin has died. We are set free from its power and we can now present ourselves to Christ and live in a manner that honors him. And we will talk about the fact that sin will still be with us until we get to glory. But we are not the same. We are not the same. Let me show you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Beginning in verse 9, Paul says to the Corinthians, Do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkard, nor revilers, nor extortioners. I mean, he could keep going on. N nor angry, nor envious, nor, s nor slanders. Nor, I, I, you, could just, you could keep going on the list. He didn't mean that this was an, uh, the, the end of the list. What he's saying is, sinners will not inherit the kingdom of God. And by that, he means people that still live in perpetual sin. Coming back to Romans. 1st he says, you have died to sin and now live apart from it. And then he says, or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Well, what does that mean? Well, he, he says, look, you, you were immersed into Jesus Christ. You who've come by faith and received the gift of God, of new birth, you are, you are immersed into him. You have come into spiritual union with Jesus Christ. Go with me to Ephesians for a minute. 
all we have, every blessing in the heavens, Lees, that God has granted to us, all are given to us in Christ. That, Listen to, uh, j- listen to just a couple of verses in Ephesians. Look, uh, in verse 1, <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Um, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. In verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The grace of God, appropriated by faith, results in substantial and dramatic changes in us. The body of sin is dead, and we are immersed into Christ spiritually. Go with me to 1 Corinthians um, 6.17. It starts in, he he is um, chastising the Corinthians because of their immorality. In 15, he says, Do you not know that that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? And in 17, he says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. There is a new spiritual reality for all those who have come to Jesus Christ, and that is that you are in union with his divine life. So, when he says you've been baptized into Christ, you were baptized into him, and spiritually, what happened is God takes you I want to say mysteriously, I don't know how else to explain it, but because you are in Him, you now are in Him while He is on the cross, and in Him when He dies, and in Him when He goes into the grave, and in Him when He comes out in resurrection life. You have died to your old person, and you are now alive to Him spiritually, because you were baptized into him. This is not water baptism. This has nothing to do with water baptism, which is just a symbolic act to, to memorialize and to be obedient to him in the reality of this spiritual baptism, which is the point at which you were saved. You came into union with the triune God. So, if you were with him in his death, then you are with him in his life. And when, it, when you died with him, you died to that old way, that, was old, that old person. And you came out a new person in resurrection life. And just as he lives, so you now live in the newness of that life. It says in verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should what? Walk in the newness of life. In other words, this newness of life is manifested in the way you live. You don't live the same way anymore. So this new life, this new life is called in 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation. Behold, anybody who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. 
old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. What do you mean new? Well, you now love God instead of being his enemy. You seek to honor and worship him instead of being in rebellion against him. You desire to serve and obey him rather than to seek all your own selfish, self-centered, sinful pleasures. You are born to the newness of life to walk in it, which is a walk in holiness, not a walk in sin. In verse 6 he says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now we're going to get into some of the specificity of what this means. It's the same point, however. The old man is crucified. Crucifixion is simply a word for dead. You get crucified, you get dead. That's uh, theological. You, 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 don't, you don't get off of that cross. You die. So, knowing this, and this is something important. In order to live the reality of this truth, you have to know it. You have to understand it. As a Christian, you should, because you should have already experienced it, but you not only need to experience the reality of your new birth, but you need to understand the implications of what God says about it. It makes all the difference in the world in how you deal with life and the issues of life. It's just knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Now look, the old man died, and that body, that old person, that old way of being, goes to the trash heap. It doesn't get fixed. It doesn't get renewed. It doesn't get recovered. It gets dead. The old man was crucified with him in that body of sin, that that body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to it. So what's done away in that? It, 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 how does that work? Well, look, um, the old man is dead, but the flesh is not. And, and the flesh is that residual old human way of being that we still have with us because we're human beings. And the flesh is weak. And the flesh is a place where sin attacks and still resides in us. But we are new creations. That portion of us that's going to eternity, it's new. We're just still human beings. So, the, the idea here is that sin, which used to be your slave master, used to own you used to control you, it's dead. The slave master is gone. Um, wh when Adam fell and when his nature was changed, it changed our nature. And when we were born, we were born as sinners. And that meant that we would always sin. We were always selfish, self-centered, we were always evil. Now, it manifests itself differently in different people. There's no question about that. You may be very self-righteous, but you still can be a terrible sinner. Or you may be a very horrible, lawless person. But the, but the scripture says all of us were enslaved to our sin and could not escape. So every action that we did was selfish, self-centered, you, there's no way to escape it. But now, it's, it's no longer something that holds you in bondage. Now, the, the, the influence of sin is still there, but its controlling ability is no longer there. It is no longer the slave master. It will still be with us, and that battle we'll see laid out for us big time in chapter 7. But the important thing to understand is sin can't hold you in bondage if you're a Christian. It can't. 
The only way you can look like you're in bondage if you're really a Christian is if you allow it to happen. Because you've been set free. You, you've died to that. That old person is dead. He says, um, Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Not that we will never sin. We will, and we'll see that. But we are no longer captive to it. We are no longer slaves of it. Because that person that was in bondage has died. And you've been born again in newness of life with Jesus Christ. So, you've been freed from sin. It is no longer your master. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ. Again, he repeats this same concept over again from verse 5. If you're living with him, you're now living in union with him. You're living a new life, a new spiritual, eternal life. You live it now, and you live it forever. You know him. That's what eternal life is. You possess his spirit. That's what eternal life is. It is a life unlike the way you lived before, which was death. So, your life is different. In verse 9, it says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over you. So, he has set you free from the bondage of sin, and he has conquered death, which is proved by his resurrection. He came out of the grave to life. And because we are in him, we've come out of the grave in life when we come by faith to him. So, death no longer has dominion over us. Well, what do you mean dominion? Well, I mean, um, it, it, it used to be the, the power of Satan. It, it, was, it was what he held over us. It was what he caused us to be fearful of and frightened of. It, it, in some cases, uh, in people's lives, it dominated their lives, the fear of dying. But, but what Paul says is there's no reason to be fearful anymore. Death has no dominion over you. Uh, Christ has met the legal requirements of the law. He has paid its penalty for you. Therefore, death cannot take you. That means all you're going to do when you die is move from here to heaven. <laughs> In life. You're living eternal life here under the constraints of still being in the flesh. We'll be living eternal life with him as soon as this flesh is no longer with us. And his resurrection proves it. Verse 10, for the death he died... He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. He died once, and he lives and has always lived to be in union with the Father. He came to do his will. He's always subjected himself to the Father whenever called. He lives to his glory. He seeks his glory. And that's where we are. We are we are the beneficiaries of his grace so that we can die to the old self and be resurrected in the newness of life and live in that newness of life. 
with nothing to fear. And knowing that sin cannot put us in bondage again. And knowing that our purpose is to glorify Him. And knowing that we have the resources to do that because we are new and we possess His Spirit and His Word. Uh, will we struggle with sin? Yeah, absolutely. Will it be a battle we have to continuously fight? Absolutely. Paul, we're going to see it in chapter 7. Paul struggled with it, and if he's struggling with it, we're all going to struggle with it. But the thing you must understand, you must understand, is that if you have been born again, if you have entered into this new life with Christ, you are not in sin's bondage. You are not. You cannot be. You're free from sin and its consequences, which is death. What Paul is saying here is grace is not license to sin. Grace has changed you and set you free to live for Him in holiness. He died once. That's all it takes. It's, that's a difficult lesson, difficult lesson for Catholic theology because Catholic theology says we have to put Him on the cross every Mass. But he died once. That was enough. That was sufficient. And if you are the recipients of His grace because you've come by faith, you have not only been saved, but you have been transformed for the purpose of glorifying Him for as long as you have here and then for eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, powerful section of Scripture beyond us in a sense to understand the mystery of how we could be placed in union with your son and transported to the cross and to the grave and out of that grave to resurrection and yet that is the very reality of what we know in our life Lord that is the reality of what we have experienced as we have seen your transforming work work in us we know Lord that we are not uh, perfect in our lives but only perfect in the righteousness that you have granted to us, given to us. But we know that we are new in our desire to pursue righteousness in our lives, Lord, to pursue holiness, to pursue you, to serve you in obedience because we love you. We know that we are not what we were, Lord. We are not what we should be, we are clearly not what you will make us to be when we reach glory. But we are not what we used to be. We have been set free from sin's bondage. It's our desire to rejoice in that truth, Lord, and to live it by your grace and only by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for making it possible. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.